Welcome to my guide to every single Masked Carnival fight currently out. In case you don't know where or what it is, the Masked Carnival is a feature of Blue Mage unlocked at each level cap. It's right outside of the Miner's Guild and is a set of many different fights of varying difficulty. Some are puzzle more than fight. And I'll be going over each one, one at a time. Be sure to use the timestamps and chapter select to get around to any specific fight you want to go over. I also want to make something clear for what this guide does. I'm intending to do things with as minimal power as possible to give everyone full rotations of enemy patterns. If I could get through a fight with one button, I will do so unless it is extremely more work than getting the one specific skill that would make things easier, with one major exception. Further, there are strategies from ethereal mimicry that make some fights easier or faster. I will not be using this skill except for one fight at the end due to the nature of said fight. And finally, there is the combination of bristle slash whistle, moon flute, and final sting slash self-destruct. This is not a strategy I will be employing except in two specific situations that will come up later. It is a recommended strategy for every fight because, as long as it clears the encounter, there is no downside. Though, you can only use it for one act due to the 10 minute cooldown. Finally, do not attempt the carnival without having level cap gear, be it level 50 ironworks for the first 25, or all the way up to current level cap. As of this clip, level cap is 70, and I am in full I-400 gear. This is as best as I can get without going full best in slot. By the point you start Blue Mage, you have the option of getting Poetics and the gear from it, so you have no excuse. I will also be bringing up any achievements tied to the carnival along the way, including the hidden achievements and giving you advice on how to reach those. But I believe that's everything to go over before getting into it. Any skills I use per fight will be within the expected skill set. Level 50 carnival fights will only use level 50 skills. I will be showing full, uninterrupted attempts at these fights. Again, to give people an idea of what it all looks like. Number one, all's well that starts well. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Starting off easy, we have three simple enemies. The slimes put poison on you, and the knight uses basic frontal AoEs. It's recommended to pull only one at a time for safety, but you should be able to handle all three at once. Just avoid the AoEs the knight uses. Number 2. Much Ado About Pudding. Requirements? Two magic spells of any two elements. I choose number 1, Water Cannon, and number 10, Glower. Recommended? Number 11, Plane Cracker. Number 19, Bomb Toss. Number 33, The Ram's Voice. Number 63, Sonic Boom. Pull one slime at a time, as they hit pretty hard and have a good amount of health. This entire duty is to teach you the importance of elemental weaknesses. Notice how slow the wind slime dies, and how fast every other slime dies when I use weaknesses. You only need Glower and Water Cannon though, as Glower can kill every slime except for the Earth Weak slime. That one, we just use Water Cannon. And while we have it, we can use it on the Water Weak slime too. If you have more elements, use them. Otherwise, just those two will be enough.
Number three, waiting for Golem. Requirements, number one, water cannon. Recommended, number 24, flying sardine for safety. Since it is water weak, Glower takes a back seat. Just like the knight in the first carnival fight, your main issue is frontal AoEs. Stay close to the golem to easily step behind it. After losing enough HP, the golem will gain two new attacks. It will cast Earth and Heart, a circular AoE aimed on your position, almost always twice in a row. These place fire puddles on the ground. You can interrupt these with Flying Sardine, but I recommend not doing so for the cast time. Just simply avoid them and keep putting out damage. It will also begin to cast Obliterate intermittently. Flying Sardine can be used to stop this skill as well, and may be recommended to bring along just in case, but it only does 1000 damage roughly. If you keep up on the damage yourself, Obliterate shouldn't be an issue. But if you intend to play it safe, bring Flying Sardine. Number 4. Gentlemen Prefer Swords. Requirements? Number 10 Glower, Number 13 White Wind, Number 24 Flying Sardine. Recommended? Number 11 Plane Cracker, Number 19 Bomb Toss. This is a 2 act fight with high damage enemies. In Act 1 we have 3 enemies at once. You cannot pull them one at a time, so you need to either kill them first or have some sort of staying power. With the extra power from the additional elements being exploited, you don't need White Wind, but bring it anyway for safety. The Wolf and Bats will regenerate a little bit of health from their attacks, so focus one down at a time to reduce incoming damage and reduce how much the healing impacts the fight. In Act 2, we have a Singular Knight weak to Lightning. The main worry here is it does have a very thin line AoE called Grand Strike, used pretty often and multiple times in a row. After getting it low on health, it will begin to cast Magitek Field and spawn six Earth Weak Beetles. These beetles hurt and can kill you fairly quickly alongside the knight's damage. You have two options. With requirements, you can silence the Magitek field and then burn the knight down. If he dies, the fight is over even if the beetles are still alive. Or instead, don't worry about the Magitek field and go to spamming Plane Cracker to kill the beetles. By the time you finish the beetles off, the Magitek field will have ended, and you can safely kill the knight off. Number 5. The Three Penny Turtles. Requirements? Number 36. 1000 Needles. The only way to damage these turtles is to use to fix damage or percent damage based spells or doom. 1000 Needles is the easiest to obtain and likely the best of all of these. The turtles can't even hurt you, which is why the arena is electrified on the outside. You will need 6 casts total to finish off the turtles.
Number 6, Eye Society. Requirements? Number 10, Glower. This is a gimmick puzzle that you can entirely ignore. The Mandragora give you a blind from their AoE, which negates all gaze mechanics, aka the eye icon from the Katoblapost and the eyes in the second act. However, blind means accuracy down as well. You can just solve the gaze mechanics the normal way by turning your character away from the enemies using them. DPS them down and it will be done in no time. Number 7, a Chorus Slime. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 31, Sticky Tongue. Our first three-act carnival fight is a gimmick fight. Slimes have very low health and will die in basically any singular attack. First act, just kill the slime to kill the ice sprites. Don't get too close though, as the slimes will kill you too when they explode. In the second act, we have ice sprites hiding behind blocks and a bunch of slimes in the middle of the arena. You must move the slimes to the ice sprites to take them out together. This is why we bring Sticky Tongue, to move the slimes around without killing them. Sticky Tongue to get the slimes around the blocks, and then kill them to kill the sprites. In our third act, we have six slimes and two giant towers. We need all three slimes on each side to kill a singular node. So sticky tongue spam to get all three slimes around the wall. However, the towers will start casting very long attacks that do a lot of damage. Hide behind the walls to avoid these attacks. Kill one slime once you have them all grouped up next to the tower, killing them all at once. Get behind the wall again immediately after you attack the slime, as the towers will do a revenge attack when they die. Because the delay of slime death into slime explosion, you do have a moment to hide, but you must be quick still. Repeat this for the second tower, and you should be good. Number 8, Bombardy of Errors. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This one is just like the slimes, but with bombs. 
The second act also has an actual fight involved, kills a small bombs to chain reaction and freeze the main enemy. I usually only ever get to do two of these as when I do one of the sides, both sides end up dying in the chain reaction. But I have seen people use both sides somehow. But even if you do use all three, you'll have to fight the main bomb for a while. It has two major attacks. The first is Sap, a slow cast but large AoE you must avoid. The other is Burst. You cannot hide behind the walls for this one. You must silence it. Use Flying Sardine every time Burst comes up. Then just slowly pick away at the bomb's health. Number 9, to kill a mocking slime. Requirements, number 1 water cannon, number 10 glower, number 13 white wind, number 24 flying sardine. Recommended, at least one spell of every other element too, number 11 plane cracker, number 19 bomb toss, number 33 the ram's voice, number 63 sonic boom. This is the first fight that ends up pretty involved. The main boss will spam Death Ray for damage, and the spell Dark. Dark is a small AoE aimed at you. Dodge out of it, and it will leave behind a dark puddle you cannot step in. After a bit, it will cast Golden Tongue, a magic buff that you would do well to interrupt with Flying Sardine. You can survive the damage buff, but it's better to just silence it. At the same time, a second slime will spawn. Focus this second slime down while dodging more dark spam from the main boss. If you have weaknesses, exploit them and then go back to pushing the main slime down until the next one spawns. The slimes seem to spawn in a consistent pattern. Wind weak, fire weak, ice weak, water weak, earth weak, lightning weak. Be careful while juggling between the two enemies. Be sure to white wind when you reach half health, and interrupt golden tongue every time the boss uses it. By the time the lightning slime spawns, the boss should be ready to die. Finish the boss when you can, as you don't need to kill the added enemies to end the fight. But if you don't kill these slimes as they spawn, you will be quickly overwhelmed by their damage.
Number 10, a little night music. Requirements. Number 10, glower. Number 13, white wind. Recommended. Number 24, flying sardine. This is the first fight with a hidden achievement. The boss is pretty simple. It will use cloud cover and iron justice as simple AoEs you must avoid. And occasionally use the interruptible King's Will to give itself a stacking buff. Let him use the buff, unless you want the easy mode version of this fight and lose out on the achievement. If you use Flying Sardine, the boss will fall very quickly. If you stay on the offensive, it will only use King's Will twice before you reach 40% HP. If you get him below 40% HP, he will stop using King's Will. We want him to use it three times, so after hitting 45% HP or so, stop attacking. This is where the real fight begins. The buff makes him take very little damage and do a lot more. He will also gain Black Nebula, an unavoidable AoE that you can interrupt. This is why we bring in Flying Sardine. Cloud Cover has also changed. Rather than being a targeted avoidable AoE, it's now an unavoidable attack you'll need to recover from. Be sure to use Lucid Dreaming as often as you can to keep your mana up between heals. After enough picking away at his health, he will fall and you will get the achievement, The Harder They Fall. Number 11, some like it excruciatingly hot. Requirement, number 10, Glower. Recommended, number 31, Sticky Tongue. This is another sort of gimmick fight. These bombs will get knocked back super far from taking any sort of damage. The first act is simple. Knock one bomb towards the other and then just spam Glower to kill them off. The second act is much more dangerous. You can't quite group up all the bombs like the first with attacking. You can easily do this fight without anything more than Glower, but it does come with the risk of making a mistake and is a bit messy to pull off, as you can see. If you take the recommended idea of bringing Sticky Tongue, you can group them all in the middle and go from there.
Number 12, the Plantum of the Opera. Requirements, number one, Water Cannon. Number 10, Glower. Number 23, Phase. Recommended, number 13, White Wind. The first act of this fight is extremely simple. Just kill off each of the plants with anything. They should die in one hit due to very low health. The second act has a water weak singular boss. It has a frontal AoE of Wild Horn. Just dodge out of the way. Soon it will cast Inflammable Fumes, which has a very long cast. This is a good opportunity for free damage, but before the cast ends, use Phase to stun the boss. This will cancel the cast. Use the stun timer to push more damage. It will then cast Spore Sack and summon a ton of plants that can hit you from anywhere. Take these out as quick as you can. All the while, Trounce will be spammed at you. Stay close to the boss to avoid these. Make quick work of the plants as inflammable fumes will go out again. Use the cast time to do damage and then phase to stop it again. The boss will continue to use AoEs at you. Just dodge them until the eventual second Spore Sack. Immediately followed into a third Spore Sack. This is where you really need to work to clear out the plants as there is a lot of them. This is why you may want to bring White Wind as these guys hurt. But quick enough work and you should be fine without it. While killing the plants, Inflammable Fumes will be cast again. Be sure to phase it away again. From this point forward, it should be a matter of just taking the boss out. Phase any further inflammable fumes and dodge the AoEs sent your way. Number 13, Beauty and the Beast. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Recommended, number 24, Flying Sardine. The first act is very simple. Kill the main enemy, then kill the two enemies that are petrified. You could theoretically use a skill to exploit their petrification, but it's hardly needed. Act 2 is a bit more involved. This is a repeat of the Hawk Manor hard boss. She will cast Void Fire 3 as a small AoE where you are. Void Arrow in a line towards you. Dark Sabbath is a gaze attack. You only need to look away for. Dark Mist is a large AoE around her. 
and Circle of Blood as a large donut around her. Make sure to keep her at the edge of the arena for all of this, and get close to her for Circle of Blood. Her next attack will be Void Fire 4, a very large AoE aimed at you, which will then cause further AoEs that chase you. You can stick towards the center of the arena to bait the AoEs and still dodge the extra attack she does, which was Circle of Blood here. Now the real fight begins with a summoning of a second enemy. You must kill this ad before the boss decides to eat her for a power boost. The boss will spam AoEs at you while you deal with the ad. Kill the ad quick because it will start casting Beguiling Mist which can send you into the electricity if it goes off. If you brought Flying Sardine, you can interrupt the cast, but you can kill her before it goes off. Afterwards, continue to pelt the boss. Eventually, she will do a weird animation that would cause the eating of the ad if you failed to kill it. This would boost Blood Rain and have it actually do damage. With the ad dead, it does basically no damage and you can finish off the boss. Number 14, Blobs in the Woods. Requirements, number 7, Loom. Number 10, Glower. This is a weird one. The first act is just two slimes behind walls. Kill them, and they will revenge cast the last song. Hide behind the walls to dodge these explosions. In the second act, the slimes will start attacking, slowing you to the point of being unable to move. This is where Loom comes in. Kill off the slimes one by one, and then loom your way to safety, behind the giant block wall. Number 15, The Mean Nobody Nodes. Requirements, number 10 Glower, number 18 Acorn Bomb, number 19 Bomb Toss, number 24 Flying Sardine. This is a fairly beefy enemy. Attack it a bunch and it will open with high voltage, an interruptible attack. Soon after it will explode with a summon, doing minor damage and spawning a single Shabti that will murder you due to a very powerful buff. Acorn bomb it to put it to sleep, and keep hitting the node. Stay close to it for Superstorm, a donut, and Piercing Laser, a line AoE. A second high voltage will go out. Interrupt this, and then you can begin to take out the Shabti. The damage up buff it had will be gone. More AoEs will come out of the node as you take care of it, and the Shabti does frontal AoEs of Spell Sword very rarely. Interrupt any other high voltages the node cast and keep beating the enemies down. Soon, the node will use Summon again, this time spawning two snakes. Keep these close to the node and dodge into the safe quarter of the arena for ballast. There will also be a high voltage while dealing with the snakes. When the snakes die, they explode into a small AoE that puts a vulnerability up onto all nearby targets, 
including the node. With two stacks of vulnerability, it will take a lot more damage. And so from this point, it's just a matter of dodging the AoEs that get sent at you over and over, and slowly knocking down the HP of the node. It may also find it in itself to use repelling cannons, pushing you to the edges of the arena. Be ready to dodge this. Interrupt any high voltage cast and keep at it till it falls. Number 16, Sunset Boulevard. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Recommended, number 7, Loom. Number 13, White Wind. The first act is a test of slide casting and playing it safe. If these Cyclops reach you, you will die. So keep backing away and kill them both off. As a note for the second act, we bring White Wind only for safety on if we make a mistake. The second act is a lot more involved. Bring it to the middle when you pull it. The cow comes with all the usual Cyclops attacks, like 10 ton slash. He will also use Voice of Authority to summon adds. Focus these down and avoid the cow's attacks. It will use 111 ton swing, pushing you away from the boss. Get away. The ad will cross through the middle of the arena when you do, giving you time to kill it off. Next is Cry of Rage, a simple gaze attack you look away for. Keep the cow near the edge of the arena from this point forward. It will do another swing, then cast the Bull's Voice, increasing its damage by a lot before sucking you in. Pop Sprint unless you're going for the point bonus, which then you will want to use Loom to dodge 1111 ton swing. Personally, I prefer Sprint, but preference and the next mechanic. As soon as the AoE marker disappears, run back up to the cow and prepare for zoom in. Don't bring it to the middle like I did. The attack will push you back near the full arena length, then use 111 ton swing. From here, it's just a matter of taking it out and doing the same AoE avoidance. Number 17, The Sword of Music. Requirements. Number 5, Drill Cannons. Number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Act 1 has two hands, both weak to lightning. However, one has a physical reflect, and the other a magic reflect. You also must take on both at once. So while you likely can, manage to separate the hands, you're most likely going to take on a lot of self-damage trying to kill one off. Focus down one or the other first, then safely take out the other that remains. Keep healing as needed and dodge the cone and line AoEs. In Act 2 we have one big Colossus. It comes with Grand Strike, which will come out in pairs. They are very thin AoEs, but very fast to go out. Keep sidestepping. Similar to the last time, it will also cast Magitek Field. 
don't concern yourself with this, and immediately get to killing off the hands that spawn at the same time. During this ad phase, the Colossus will use Magitek Ray, which will leave behind fire puddles. Just dodge and continue to focus down the hands while more Grand Strikes come out. After a bit, a second Magitek field will be cast. Flying Sardine this one away. Another Magitek Ray will go out, but don't bother interrupting this. Focus on taking down the boss's health while dodging anything else it throws out, and interrupting any further Magitek fields. Number 18, Midsummer Night's Explosion. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Recommended, number 1, Water Cannon. This is a fun one, but basically the same in both acts. Drag the Manticore around the map. Blowing up barrels as you go by damaging them, or having the Manticore damage them. They have three attacks. Frontal Cleave, an aimed fire attack that has no AoE indicator, and a Russian that pushes you back. Pay attention to the animations, and be careful not to stand in the barrel explosions. They are pretty big. If the Manticore is still alive after all the barrels are gone, just spam attacks until it dies. We bring Water Cannon only for the rare cases you end up being too far away from the enemy to use Glower, or will accidentally blow up a barrel prematurely otherwise. In Act 2, as I said, it's basically the same thing. They have a seemingly a lot less health, but make the process a lot more chaotic. You will usually get both Manticores in the same explosions, but it is possible that some barrels will only hit one of the Manticores due to their patterns being different. Also, the barrels do count toward the kill count. They must all explode for you to finish the fight.
Number 19, on a clear day, you can smell forever. Requirements, number five, drill cannons. Number 13, white wind. Recommended, number 24, flying sardine. The opening move of this thing is reflect, meaning we need to rely on physical attacks. This is otherwise a fight similar to all mortal fights. We have the slow casting huge frontal cleave that is bad breath. Stay close at all times to avoid it. We also have Vine Probe, a large frontal line AoE. The thing to potentially worry about is Oful Breath, a circular AoE aimed where you were standing. It can be interrupted though, and if you don't, it will leave behind a goo puddle. Not something to worry about for Act 1. Act 2 is mostly more of the same, but you'll be hurt a lot more and is where you need a few white wins. You may also want to flying sardine the awful breath for the new mechanic, Schizocarps. This will summon a ton of adds that you can't kill. Stand at the edge of the electricity between two hips and look outside the arena. The range of the gaze these give off is very narrow. You will immediately have to make an escape after the gaze goes off or be hit with bad breath. From there, it's just the same stuff. Dodge the AoEs and keep putting out damage, and also be sure to heal yourself up as needed. Number 20, Miss Typhon. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 30, Mighty Guard. Number 34, The Dragon's Voice. Recommended, number 8, Final Sting. Number 12, Bristle. Number 19, Bomb Toss. Number 20, Off Guard. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 39, Moon Flute. As you can tell from the skill list, this is the most involved fight yet. Starting with Typhon, she will push you back and then use Fireball. Simply dodge and prepare for Snort. You have two options here. The first is to turn on Mighty Guard and just heal through it. But I much more recommend just putting on Diamond back. Afterwards, Typhon will do a pushback and then repeat the entire pattern for when she uses a second pushback in a row. Even with only Glower, you can take out Typhon before the second Snort goes out, but you can just Diamond back a second time if needed. Act 2 brings in Ultros, who is weak to fire, so Bomb Toss is nice here instead. He's pretty basic. Aqua Breath is a frontal AoE, Mega Volt a large AoE around him, and Imp Song will turn you into an Imp. Just interrupt it. Then he'll use Aqua Breath and Mega Volt with randomly placed circular AoEs, and more Imp Song. Then he seems to repeat the attacks without the AoEs. He'll die around this point with Bomb Toss, but nothing new comes out otherwise if he lives longer.
finally, we have Act 3, Typhon Returns. I highly, highly recommend just doing an attack or two for safety, then preparing a final sting. Bristle, Moon Flute, Off Guard, then Final Sting. This will give the secret achievement Octopath Traveler. I already had it, but you can see on screen I got the bonus of Trouble with Tentacles. We'll see what this is about in another clip. This is where the rest of the requirements kick in, rather than the recommended. Typhon follows the exact same pattern as before. Diamondback in the middle of the arena, or Mighty Guard through the first snort. Ultros will spawn during the fireball, and spawn four tentacles on the outside of the arena. The moment Diamondback ends, start spamming the dragon's voice. It will likely take two casts to take them all out. If you don't kill them, you're going to have a huge issue in the next mechanic. Typhon will begin to cast Snort again. Turn on Mighty Guard and Sure Cast, and prepare to Flying Sardine Ultros' Imp Song. Heal through Snort and turn off Mighty Guard to do damage. Take out Ultros as fast as you can, especially if you have Bomb Toss. Try and down him before the next Snort, so you can just diamond back your way through it. Especially because Surecast won't be back up and will cause you a lot of damage like you saw happen to me when I missed Surecast. So there's two options for this fight. Good luck if you decide to do the hard route. Number 21, Chimera on a Hot Tin Roof. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 24, Flying Sardine. First part, super easy. Just kill the enemies. Can Flying Sardine the Void Blizzard if needed? Act 2 is a normal Chimera. The Ram's voice, get away. The Dragon's voice, get in. He will also use the Ram's Keeper, which will place a large ice puddle on the ground if you let it get off just flying sardine it away. Eventually, adds will start spawning. Take them out as soon as they do, and keep an eye on which attack the Chimera is doing. Very little to this one.
Number 22, here comes the boom. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Act 1, just kill the bombs. The only worry is if you use a very, very weak skill, they will explode and kill you. As long as you use any normal skill, they will die in one hit. Act 2 actually has stuff to worry about. Scalding Scolding is a frontal AoE, and like all bomb matriarchs, we have Sap. Bait Sap towards the edge anytime you can though, and run to the middle. The Sap comes with a bunch more AoEs after it lands. Only a small section of the arena will be safe. Run to it immediately. This will be followed with Bombshell Drop. This will summon an add. This first time, the Arena Grenade from Act 1. Target it and kill it in one hit. You will be given a bit of time before the boss casts Ignition. If the bomb is alive when Ignition goes off, you die. Deal with more Scaldings and Saps to get to the next Bombshell Drop. Around the arena, a blue bomb will spawn. Do not hit this gas bomb. Instead, run behind it and hit it towards the boss, and then leave it go. The boss will be very slowly casting Burst to kill you. You must let the boss be hit by the gas bomb's attack, Flesh Thum, to stop it. Be sure you're not attacking after getting the gas bomb into place. From here, Mechanics will just repeat. Kill grenades before ignition. Bait sap towards the edge to make dodging the AoEs after easier. And push gas bombs into the boss. Number 23, Behemoths and Broomsticks. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 29, Diamondback. This is your typical Behemoth, which means there's a bunch to deal with. Cherubdis is a wind tornado that will occasionally pulse larger. This will be comboed directly into Trounce, a large cone AoE. Aim it outside the arena where you can. Then it will use Comet combined with Trounce. Move to the safe spots wherever they appear, as the Comets are very random. He will repeat this again. Try and be as close as you can to the first Charbdis, as both will be on the arena for a bit longer. He will Cherubdis into Comets with Trounces, and then cast Ecliptic Meteor. Diamondback this to survive, then White Wind to heal up. Even with Diamondback, you will take half your health. From here, mechanics will just repeat over and over. He has a lot of health to chop through though.
Number 24. Amazing Technicolor Pit Fiends. Requirements. Number 5. Drill Cannons. Number 10. Glower. Number 13. White Wind. Number 24. Flying Sardine. Number 29. Diamondback. The first act is just to introduce you to the concept of needing physical attacks for the mage dolls and magic attacks for the warrior dolls. They do some basic targeted AoEs and cones. Take one out at a time and then move on to Act 2. Act 2 is here to force Flying Sardine to dodge Silence and Diamondback to block Condensed Libra Triple Hit. Condensed Libra puts a debuff on you that makes Triple Hit hurt really hard, even with a Diamondback. The boss will then begin to cast Mechano Gravity regularly and spawn a pair of adds. Take them out the same way as in Act 1 and then get back to the boss. Don't be an idiot like me and think you need to diamond back a second time. You only need it the one time, at least as far as I know. It never used triple hit a second time for me. It really was just a barrier to entry kind of mechanic. Act 3 is completely different. Keep him towards the edge as much as you can. Page Tear is a frontal cleave with no AoE marker, like the Manticores in the previous fights. Magic Hammer is a large AoE centered on you, but slow cast. Gale Cut will randomly place wind currents around the arena. He will follow this into Head Down. Get as close as you can to the boss and check the path in front of the boss is clear. You will be knocked back about half the length of the arena and be targeted with Magic Hammer. You want lots of leeway to dodge both the wind and the Magic Hammer. Next is Bone Shaker that will spawn more adds. Kill these as soon as possible and dodge anything the boss does. If you are slow to kill the adds, they will jump on you and explode. From there, it's all repeat mechanics. Chase down adds after Bone Shaker, dodge AoEs that get sent at you, and be sure to keep the boss on the edge for any Gale Cuts. Number 25, Dirty Rotten Azul Magia. Requirements? Number 5, Drill Cannon. Number 7, 
Loom. Number 10, Glower. Recommended. Number 1, Water Cannon. Number 4, Flying Frenzy. Number 11, Plane Cracker. Number 15, Sharpened Knife. Number 19, Bomb Toss. Number 33, The Ram's Voice. Number 63, Sonic Boom. Replace Sonic Boom with Garuda's Feather Rain and Flying Frenzy with 4 tons weight and you have my setup for this fight. To melee beat the fight, you only need a magical attack, a physical attack, and loom. The hidden achievement for this fight requires a lot to complete. You need to damage him with one attack of every element, one of every physical type of attack which is piercing, slashing, and blunt, and you also need loom still. What you will be seeing is my use of the full required and recommended kit for perfect blue. I hear that knockback wind moves also count for wind, but I see mixed reports on that. To get perfect blue, you must use one of every element, one of every physical type, take no damage, and beat the fight within the time limit. Using only the required toolkit is basically just the same fight, but with less buttons. We'll be going over a perfect blue clip, but all the strategies are consistent. Act 1 will have Azulmagir open with Ice Spikes, making all physical attacks do reflected damage. Stick to just magic for the entire act. He will begin to cycle through a lot of moves that all just need practice to dodge. Apocalyptic Bolt is just a simple line AoE towards you, but it's pretty big. Then he'll become a Chimera using the Ram's voice and the Dragon's voice. Like always, get out for Ram, get in for Dragon. When he's not using the Ram's voice, stay as close as possible as you can manage. Continue to dodge the bolts until Plane Cracker comes out. This starts with an AoE around a Zulmagia like Ram's voice, but then causes two randomly placed huge Dona AoEs. Dodge into the safe spots as quick as you can. After another set of Chimera attacks, he will Plane Cracker again. This time will come with two sets of AoEs, the set of large donuts, and then a set of much smaller donuts. You have very little time to react, but try and stand with Azulmagia between you and the safe spots for Apocalyptic Roar. This may trip you up the first time with how fast this all comes out, and how random the AoE placements are. From here, just finish him off while avoiding attacks. Act 2 begins with him using Repelling Spray. You must rely on physical attacks for this entire phase. After an apocalyptic bolt, he will summon two blazing angons. These should be taken down immediately with your physical attacks. They enrage quickly and should only take one attack each to take down. From there, it's just about dodging the same attacks as before in Act 1. He will do nothing new. If he begins to summon blazing angons again and isn't about to die, Shift your focus to taking those out again before finishing him off. Act 3 will have Azulmagia swapping between Repelling Spray and Ice Spikes, starting with Repelling Spray. He will then cycle through his attacks normally, handle them all the same, staying close.
After a roar, he will use Charbidus, placing four tornadoes around the arena. Dodge the apocalyptic bolt and head to the edge of the arena between two tornadoes for Webb. Webb reduces your movement speed to almost zero. Standing at the edge of the arena for this helps us bait the next attack, Meteor. This is a very large AoE that also leaves behind a fire puddle. Use Loom twice to get out of this. It's less efficient than using it once, but it's a lot safer. After Meteor, he will swap to Ice Spikes. Be careful here and hold your attacks until after it finishes casting, then swap to Magic. Now for the final push. Plane Cracker will go out. This one is the Double Donuts, plus an Apocalyptic Bolt. Between the Cherubdis and the Puddle, there is very little room for movement. This may take a few tries to get a good pattern and proper movement around the Tornadoes. He will follow it up with another Plane Cracker and Apocalyptic Roar. During this cast, Cherubdis will end and give you more room to breathe. After this, the arena should clear up and it becomes a matter of finishing him off. Congrats on Perfect Blue if you brought the setup. If you've somehow not killed him by this point, he will now just start to repeat his mechanics. Number 26, Papa Mia. Requirements? Number 10, Glower. Number 11, Plane Cracker. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 57, Eerie Sound Wave. Number 73, Exuviation. Now we're in Heaven's Word tier fights, they expect Heaven's Word tier skills. The boss opens with alternate plumage, which makes itself near impossible to kill. Use Eerie Sound Wave to remove the buff. Caber Toss will instantly murder you without Flying Sardine to interrupt it. For a bit he will stop using skills, but puts out insane DPS. White Wind as needed, and prepare for Gust. This is a fast but very small AoE to dodge multiple times in a row. From here, mechanics will just repeat already, and you just need to do the same things to avoid them. Papa here in Act 2 is immune to electricity, so swap to Plane Cracker for boosted DPS. Raw Instinct is this axe requirement for Eerie Soundwave. He will hit very hard otherwise. Body Blow hurts even without the buff. Be ready to heal up. Void Thunder 2 is a small AoE that summons a cloud that will repeatedly explode into a large AoE. Stay very far away from these, and drag Papa around the edge of the arena. He will use this a second time, and the first cloud will soon after move towards you. This drags it to the edge and prepares you for Dad Joke. Point yourself to the middle of the room when the arrow appears, and you'll be knocked to the opposite side. Heal up after and get moving when the clouds once again move to you. Papa's final trick is Void Thunder 3. This does light damage, but puts a very heavy dot on you. Use Exuviation to clear it up, and move when the clouds move one final time. From here, mechanics will repeat. Kite Papa and the clouds around the edge. Remove any buffs and debuffs. Keep yourself healed up, and he will fall.
Number 27. Lock up your snorters. Requirements. Number 1. Water cannon. Number 10. Glower. Number 25. Snort. Or number 31. Sticky tongue. I go with sticky tongue. Recommended. Number 97. Hydro pool. This is the worst fight in the entire carnival. The main goal per phase is to prevent the bombs from blowing up the mines. Use Sticky Tongue on the bomb closest to the mine and drag it to a different direction. Typhon will then snort and push all bombs to the edges of the arena. And also you. Move the bomb out of the way and immediately start killing the mine. It has a tight and rage timer. But also, don't stand too close to the bomb because Typhon will also throw a fireball at you. This can blow up the mine too. After a second fireball, there will be a second pattern of bombs and a mine. These bombs cannot hit the mine from where they are, so it's all safe. If you are feeling spicy, attempt to drag a bomb over to Typhon away from the mine. At the same time, Typhon will funga and push anything in front of her away. If you timed it right, the bomb will not be affected by funga. When it explodes, it will damage Typhon. This is the only real way to damage her. The bombs. Kill the mine and wait for the third pattern. It will be eight bombs with no mines. Try and get two mines up to her at minimum and time it with the funga or the bombs will get pushed away again. You could also potentially use Snort in place of Sticky Tongue, but I always have issues using that one effectively. But if used right, you can get four bombs up to Typhon in this one phase. And so, that's the whole fight. It repeats from there. Kill off mines, draw bombs to Typhon to damage her, and it takes eight bombs to kill her if you don't do enough DPS to account for an entire bomb, but you should use enough DPS to at least account for one bomb. What I recommend meanwhile is to just not do this fight until level 70 and get Hydro Pool. On the 8 bomb pattern, wait for Funga, then Swift cast Hydro Pool in the direct center of the arena. This will destroy Typhon instantly. Number 28, Dangerous Wind Dead. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 19, Bomb Toss. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This is a repeat of the Forgal boss from the Weeping City of Mach, essentially, but with a lot more mechanics. Whenever Doom Impending is being cast, White Wind to get back to max HP. If you are max HP, Doom will auto-cleanse. If Doom Impending gets off, you can't heal and will die. Next is March of the Draugr, which summons adds. The first time is a group of eight mummies. They hurt a lot, and Bomb Toss even stuns them. Heal yourself as needed and burn them down. Be wary of Cackle as you do. This hurts and should be interrupted with Flying Sardine ASAP. After a moment is Necrobane, 
a slow AoE that leaves behind a puddle. This is followed by Mega Death. At the end of the cast bar, get into the puddle. You will not be able to survive Mega Death unless you are inside the puddle. Notice the glow around the boss is different and the slow cast time. We'll come back to this in a moment. He'll then finish off with Hellblower Shriek, which is just basic AoE damage. The next use of March of the Draugr is four soldiers. They stand in the electricity and damage you very hard with Fire 3. Bomb Toss should kill them in one hit, and you need to heal up as needed. Avoid the Necrobane Puddle and watch the cast. It's the same sparkling animation as Mega Death, but it isn't Mega Death. Funeral Pyre is a trick to get you to go into the puddle. It otherwise doesn't do all that much damage, but heal up after it hits. There will be another Shriek, followed by a third March of the Draugr. This will be four undead warriors that also hurt a lot. Be ready to heal a lot, and kill off the ads before Brainstorm leaves your attention. Brainstorm will give you a debuff of Forced March. Your character will be forced to walk in that direction, based on which direction your character is currently facing. From the middle of the arena, aim your character towards the safe spot. You will automatically walk into it. If you are off-centered, you may need to take a step afterwards to avoid the AoEs. One more Heblar Shriek, and the final March of the Draugr will go out. Only two Gravekeepers, but they have a lot of HP and still hurt a lot. They walk slow so you can do some slight kiting, but it is still very limited. Kite them around the edge of the arena and heal as needed. From here you'll start seeing the other mechanics repeat. Doom Impending, Megadeth, Cackle, and everything else. Deal with mechanics as they come, and don't worry about any more ads. That truly was the final set of ads.
Number 29, Red, Fraught, and Blue. Requirements, number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended. Number 50, Alpine Draft. Highly recommend Alpine Draft for Act 1. This is a hard carnival fight. The opening is Fluid Swing, requiring an interrupt from Flying Sardine. After a moment will be Sea of Flames. This is like Ifrit Eruptions. Get out of the cracked ground areas as they will explode. Pyretic is simple. Stop doing everything. You take damage for every action you do while Pyretic is up. Wait for Pyretic to run out before moving. After an auto or two will be Pillar of Flame. It will always alternate inside and outside safe spots. So stay near the edge for most of the fight, but also be ready for Rush. This is an unavoidable AoE that does more damage the closer you are to the boss. Run at least half the arena away to survive. Flare Star will make an exploding fireball in the center that also does damage based on proximity. This explosion will summon three tornadoes. Do not stand in these. They will cast Fire Blast line AoEs at your position. Make your way to the open quarter of the arena and stand near one of the tornadoes. While doing so, interrupt Fluid Swing. The second set of Fire Blasts will be paired with Pillar of Flame. If you aim them all next to the tornado, the open side of the arena will have a nice safe spot to stand in. Remember that there's always two Pillars of Flame back to back and head towards the middle but while keeping the boss near the edge. A third set of Fire Blasts will be paired with Rush. Aiming them roughly down the middle will allow you to run straight to the edge of the arena between two tornadoes for the Rush. This marks the end of the tornado phase and when you should run into the middle of the arena. One final Pillar of Flame pattern will be introduced. Only a small area near the edge will be safe and where this spot is is random. The middle of the arena is the safest place to be until it appears. From there, all mechanics will repeat. Take him down and enter Act 2. Two is even harder than the first, but shares many of the same mechanics. Protean Wave will do two AoEs. First, a cone coming out of the front of the boss. Just dodge this. The AoE only appears at the end of the cast bar, but it is always in front of the boss. The second is an unavoidable bit of damage. Throttle will come next and will kill you if you do not Exuviation to cleanse the debuff. Also be sure to heal. After a moment will be Ferrofluid. These are magnets. Remember the rules. Opposites attract and the same will repel. If you have the opposite polarity, get far away. If you have the same polarity, stand on top of him. The AoE you must avoid will follow these rules too. Fluid Ball will chase you with two AoEs. Just keep moving after the first AoE goes out and prepare to use Flying Sardine for an interrupt. Now things get hard. Watery Grasp will spawn two adds. Immediately burst down the small one, then the big one. If the adds live for too long, they will cast a spell to eat 5,000 mana from your pool, and the small one begins their cast sooner than the large one. So kill the small one, then the big one and then Flying Sardine to interrupt another Fluid Swing. Use Diamondback to block Big Splash. This will hit heavily four times, even with Diamondback. so heal up for Cascade. A raid wide that will spawn three tornadoes randomly around the arena edges. Much like in the fire act, 
These will shoot AoEs at you, but this time Protean Waves. So try and be near the Tornadoes to minimize their effect. The first Protean Waves will be paired with Fluid Swing from the boss. The second set will be followed up with a Protean Wave from the boss. And then the third will be followed with Fluid Ball. While being chased by the Fluid Ball AoEs, move to the point of the arena furthest away from the Tornadoes. They are all about to explode and do proximity damage. At the same time as the explosions, the boss will do Throttle into Fluid Swing. Immediately begin to cast Exuviation when it hits, and then Flying Sardine the Fluid Swing. The timing is very tight, so don't let yourself go into the tornado explosions with a low HP. You don't have time to heal. And then mechanics will repeat. Follow magnet rules for ferro fluid and such, and Undertow should fall before the next big splash. If he doesn't, just diamond back and you should have time before the next set of tornadoes. Number 30, The Catch of the Siegfried. Requirements? Number 5, Drill Cannon. Number 10, Glower. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended? Number 1, Water Cannon. Number 4, Flying Frenzy. Number 11, Plane Cracker. Number 15, Sharpened Knife. Number 19, Bomb Toss. Number 33, The Ram's Voice. Number 63, Sonic Boom, and more. Just like Perfect Blue, we have the Celestium's Finest. It has all the same requirements. Do damage with one of every element, one of every physical type, take no damage, and beat within the par time. There is a new requirement too. In Act 3, you must kill all adds that appear. But that is recommended anyway. Act 1 is our intro. He will open with Magic Drain, giving him a 30 second reflect and regen to magic. Switch to physical attacks until it runs out. This is followed by Ankle Graze, which will bind you to the spot. Exuviation is how we get free. Do it as soon as possible to prepare for Hyperdrive. This will target your position four times. Try and stay towards the middle of the map as you lead the explosions around. Siegfried will randomly jump to a cardinal direction and cast Magitek Explosive. Eight bombs will drop, and there will be one safe spot opposite of him. This always seems to be to his left the first three times this mechanic goes out. Stand right next to the bomb, directly in front of Siegfried, and have his rubber bullet push you to the safe spot. Aim your camera towards it too, as you may need to slightly adjust. From here, the mechanics just repeat. He won't magic drain again, but he will cycle through ankle graze, hyperdrive, explosives, and rubber bullet until he falls. As I said, the first three cycles all seem to place the spot to his left. The fourth cycle will be to the right.
Act 2 is likely where you will make your first mistake. Law of the Torch is a three-pronged cone AoE. Dodge out of the middle cone to be between two cones and push towards the middle. We want to be mid for Swift Steel, a light knockback followed by a donut and several randomly placed AoEs. Adjust as needed to be pushed towards the safe spot. Stick towards the edge of the safe spot and Siegfried will jump to you for Spark Steel, doing an AoE around him. This leaves behind a small fire puddle and summons two sets of larger fire AoEs in random spots. Avoid the larger explosions and deal with Shatter Steel. I highly recommend having Sprint nearby for this. He will do a large AoE around himself and explode all of the ice shards around him. Look for the empty spot in the circle of ice and head to the very edge of the arena. Notice how the fire puddle is where the safe spot is. This is why you may want to sprint and why you want to keep the fire puddle at the edge of the swift steel AoE. You have room to walk around it while also leaving the middle of the arena open. Siegfried will randomly jump around spamming Law of the Torch until he begins the pattern again. Practice up on Shadow Steel as the big sticking point for this fight is Act 3. Siegfried is done playing nice for Act 3. He opens with Magic Drain again, so throw out some physical attacks. He will then jump mid for Magitek Decoy. He will summon an Ice Weak ad. These ads must be killed for his perfect blue requirements. Focus this ad down even if you aren't going for the achievement, as he and Siegfried will both be using attacks at you. Siegfried will hyperdrive, but only will explode once, while the clone uses Swift Steel. Right before Swift Steel resolves, Siegfried will jump and use Law of the Torch. Run to any of the safe spots made and quickly finish off the ad. It will use Law of the Torch a few times as well, but you can kill it before these come out with more skills. With the ad gone, Siegfried will go back to Ankle Graze and Hyperdrive, Exuviation it away and dodge the added Law of the Torch. Prepare for Phase 2. The second clone is Wind Week. Be slightly off-center to place the clone Spark Steel AoE while Siegfried uses Hyperdrive. They then will both spam Law of the Torch. This is by far the easiest part, more of a breather before the finale. Deal with another Ankle Graze and Hyperdrive combo and prepare for Phase 3. Phase 3 begins with Siegfried using Magic Drain. Be careful with taking out the ad because if you hit Siegfried, you will regret it. This one is weak to fire though, so it should be relatively safe. Siegfried will hyperdrive, while the clone uses Shadow Steel. Head to the safe spot and be immediately ready to dodge Law of the Torch after it goes off. There is a little bit of time, but it's a tight shave. However, I have also seen Law of the Torch go out before Shadow Steel. I do not know what causes this, but it has cost me an attempt before, and may cost you an attempt. From here, both will use Law of the Torch a few times before the ad falls. And then it's just repeating mechanics until Siegfried falls. He will even bring back Magitek Explosive from Act 1. You will however notice at the end I do not get the Celestium Finest as a point bonus. That was because I was too slow. That's right, what you see here is too slow. That was why I said you need, and more, for recommended skills. 
you want to bring in some extra power for the achievement, and even Final Sting strats for a huge burst damage at the end of an act. Number 31, Anything Go-Go's. Okay, I'm going to break formula here because Go-Go is a huge difficulty increase depending on how you do it. For requirements, I say have any attack spell. I use number 53, Electrogenesis. Number 77, Ethereal Mimicry, to which I recommend Healer Mimicry. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 57, Eerie Soundwave number 73, Exuviation, and number 13, White Wind. Instead of White Wind though, if you go for Healer Mimicry, use number 58, Palm Cure. If you don't, you will probably want number 17, Blood Drain, to keep your mana up. Again, these are just the requirements for what may be a very long and hard fight. This is the only fight for the Stormblood section, and you should bring absolutely everything to bear for this one. High level gear, as many skills as you can get, and basically every possible primal skill if you want to go for pure azure. That is to say, the secret achievement. You must take zero vulnerability stacks and clear within the required part of time. I am not using an optimal setup, but notice everything I am bringing along to get pure azure. Number 8, Final Sting. Number 9, Song of Torment. Number 12, Bristle. Number 17, Blood Drain. Number 20, Off Guard. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 39, Moonflute. Number 44, Feather Rain. Number 47, Shock Strike. Number 48, Glass Dance. Number 53, Electrogenesis. Number 57, Eerie Soundwave. Number 58, Palm Cure. Number 60, Magic Hammer. Number 64, Whistle. Number 73, Exuviation. Number 75, Devour. Number 77, Ethereal Mimicry on Healing Mimicry. Number 78, Supernaka. Number 80, J Kick. Number 103, Phantom Flurry. Number 104, Night Bloom. And I wasted a slot with number 46 Mountain Buster, which I do not use. And I also didn't use Blood Drain, but I kept it just in case. Even with all of this, it's over a 6.5 minute fight. Sort of a final exam for everything you've done so far. Start by getting 2-3 to three quick attacks on Go-Go. The third would need Swift Cast to get out. Then, stop attacking. You can use heals and buffs, but any attack on Gogo will enrage him and instantly kill you. That is what Mimic is for. Anytime he casts Mimic, follow his lead by recovering and buffing and not attacking. When Mimic falls, the real fight begins. Any burst you have set up, use now and prepare for a lot of mechanics. The first real mechanic is Mimic Sap. Sap will explode three times, appearing where you are standing. You must be moving before the second or third AoE even appear to dodge them. You can get in one cast between each sap though. This will be followed by Mimicked Imp Song. Just like Ultros, throw a fish. Get healing after this as soon will be Mimicked Doom Impending. If you are not max HP when this finishes casting, you will die. This will be followed by another Mimic. Buff and heal during this as well, and prepare for Mimic to Bunshin, aka a clone.
the clone will use a cross between Protean Wave and Law of the Torch. When aimed at you, it will actually miss you as the empty spot between the prongs is in the middle. At the same time, the main Gogo will use Mimicked Fire Blast in a line towards you. The strategy I use to minimize movement is to slide cast a lot and constantly move away from the real Gogo. Then I move closer or further away from the clone as needed. Cancel any casts you think you can't sneak out. Mimic Draw Instinct follows and is our only required use of Eerie Sound Wave. From there, mechanics will repeat. Handle each one the same as before and finish him off as soon as you can. But save Burst for the next phase ideally. Act 2 is what we did all of our preparations for, really. Mimic is gone, but in its place are a slew of new attacks he will use back to back for an opener. Go Go Fire 3 is an AoE that applies Pyretic. Get away from Go Go whenever you see this cast. He will always follow it up with Go Go Blizzard 3, which is a large AoE all around him. This time will also be followed with Go Go Thunder 3 which leaves behind a huge puddle of electricity. His opener will finish off with Gogo Flare into Gogo Holy. These both hit very hard and should be healed through. When Gogo jumps to the middle, he will cast Gogo Meteor, which comes with a lot of Gogo comments. I will play this part of the clip twice in a row because of how much is going on. Gogo Meteor has three meteors to deal with, the first is a proximity marker that always appears to the east. Get to the west side of the map and dodge all the comets. Then do the opposite. The second meteor will land to the west, so run east. Get to the edge and then cast Diamondback for an unavoidable third meteor that will do major damage even when under Diamondback. You may need to practice this phase a few times before you get it down. The biggest issue is, coincidentally, the big AoE markers that appear. They often block your path to the edge of the arena. You do have time to move after the AoEs disappear. So don't panic when the AoEs are in your way. Next is Charbdis, which will place two tornadoes at opposite into Cardinals of the Arena. If you got to the east edge, you don't need to move. He will then cast Ice Storm. Use Exuviation twice when Ice Storm finishes. It puts both a dot and a heavy on you. Heal up to and get as close to the edge as possible. Gogo will use Gogo Thunder 3 three times. Place these close together and move to the other side of the arena away from Gogo. -Go. He will use Gogo -Go Fire 3, Pyretic, into Gogo -Go Blizzard 3 just like at the start of the fight, so you need to use the Thunder 3s to put distance between you both. And then the fight will loop from here, starting from Gogo -Go Flare and Gogo -Go Holy. That's right, only two major mechanics but both of them are extremely busy. If you did not go for heal and mimicry, be sure to absolutely spam Lucid Dreaming to have enough mana for every loop of Gogo -Go Meteor. If you're going for pure azure, sometime during Cherbdis is your last shot for Final Sting the second time around. It does about 13% of his health without a crit for me, and dealing with the thunders takes a long time. I only had about 20 seconds left on the timer before I'd lose the part time. But that is pure azure.
And that covers every fight in the Masked Carnival as of now. When more are added, I will either add it on to the end of this video and re-upload, or create a separate video for it. Either way, it will be in the description. Do read and check the comments for any other strategies people might suggest. Blue Mage has a lot more to it, but if you really push it, you can get away with surprisingly little. But take care and may the power of Ananid Hogsley waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra extra special thanks to Eamon Al Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Body Clock, Ethan, Ethan Olsen, James, Kevin Lowe, Kyle Steinhauser, Mizella, Scott Stanley, and Valor LLC. Links down below if you want to join my Discord or anything like that. Thank you for watching.